Thanks very much, Martin. And we look forward to having you in Cork again. And you're very welcome uh, at our end of the neck of the woods if you're ever in uh, Ireland again. So uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and for the very kind invitation to speak at this conference, uh, which is always great fun. And um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about phage host interactions in dairy streptococci. This is, I guess, one of my core themes, uh, always in the foodie space. Um, but there are implications for phage host interactions in the gram positive scene overall. So there are implications much broader than uh, just the food uh, zone. So this is a real whistle stop tour of, of kind of a lot of activities that we've been doing recently. And just to maybe introduce a bit of background, why are we interested in this at all? So the global dairy food, um, industry is highly financially um, valuable, but also in terms of, um, of employment and so on. It's a huge sector and is an industry that needs to be protected. Um, among these uh, fermented foods and fermented dairy foods in particular, um, Streptococcus thermophilus is one of the most dominantly exploited starter culture bacterial species. And as consumers change and as we change as a population, we're moving towards maybe slightly away from dairy and um, agri-based um, kind of foods or animal-based foods and moving towards many plant-based replacement fermented uh, food products. But as we do so, we still need these bacterial cultures to ferment these products and to produce the uh, products with the flavors and taste attributes that we're familiar with. So we still need bugs like Streptococcus thermophilus. And while you ferment these products, because you're using such high concentrations of cells, it's a perfect environment for phage to proliferate and um, you know, increase in numbers in a very, very fast uh, manner. So we really need to understand very well and continuously understand the diversity, the ecology, the um, interactions and the evolution of dairy streptococci and their in, and infecting phage. So that's where we're coming from with this. So until recently, we thought this was a fairly, you know, uninteresting species because as a species, Streptococcus thermophilus has long been demonstrated to be relatively homogenous um, as a species. So also were its phage. And there were two main groups of dairy streptococcal phage called the COS and PAC, which have been recently renamed the Moineau and Brusso viruses. And these dominated in fermentations in industry. But in the last decade, three additional groups have been identified, the 5093, the 987s, and just last year, the P738s. The identification of three novel phage groups in the period of a, of a decade is startling and gives us pause for thought that we need to really keep on top of this monitoring um, process to understand how these phage are evolving. And basically they're acquiring um, me genetic material from phages derived from other streptococci, um, other streptococci and indeed lactococci as well. So these are a fascinating group of phage that seem to be moving and adapting very quickly to whatever is available in order to overcome the hurdles presented by CRISPR um, and other phage defenses presented by their host. So what's the receptor then? And this is, I guess, something that I'm very much interested in. What's the receptor for dairy streptococcal phage? And in our group, we've been um, interested in this theme, but also researchers in, in Danish research groups have pushed this forward very well over the past number of years. And so we know now that it's some cell wall polysaccharide components. And this may be represented by exopolysaccharides or EPS for some phage groups uh, where loosely associated, um, uh, loose associations with the cell surface. And then there are the rhamnose glucose polysaccharides, which are embedded and exposed on the cell surface, but not to the same extent as EPS. So the rhamnose glucose polysaccharide or RGP is something that we've been particularly interested in in my research group. And these uh, structures are encoded by a gene cluster of 
in or about 25 KB. So through a whole series of mutational analysis and uh, functional genomics, we've come to understand now that these clusters, gene clusters of 25 KB or so, um, are comprised of two regions. One that's associated with the production of what we call the Ramnan core structure, which is embedded within the peptidoglycan. And this is encoded by the rightward end of that gene cluster. And then the leftward end of the gene cluster is associated with um, putting an extension or a side chain onto that core structure. And it's this side chain that's likely to be exposed on the cell surface, and in many cases to act as a phage receptor. So the process that we go through, and we've done this for a number of phage and we continue to do so, is to isolate phage resistant derivatives of a, a, a whole strain, Streptococcus thermophilus strain, and isolate those um, phage resistant mutants, look at their uh, genome sequence and compare them to the wild type. But what we noticed is that many of these phage resistant variants have what we call phenotypic aberrations in that they tend to sediment in broth. When we look at them under the microscope, sometimes they also make very, very long chains, or indeed they may aggregate into almost like ball-like structures. So this is also a hint for us that we're on the right track and that these are RGP associated mutants when we find these kind of phenotypic aberrations. And in the majority of cases, this is, this is the case. Um, maybe in the background, I should mention that we also silence the CRISPR in order to drive it towards the actual receptor. And that's our mechanism. That's how we know that they're not CRISPR uh, associated. And we also check the sequences uh, of the CRISPR arrays as well. So this is just an example, but again, this is our process for a number of strains. So again, I mentioned that there is a core, um, which is indicated in yellow uh, structure of Ramnan backbone. And then these side chain structures that vary in complexity and composition and that extend and that are attached to this core structure. And what we find in the majority of cases, at least, is that the mutants or the bacteriophage insensitive mutants or BIMS, they will have the core remnant structure, but they either lose the side chain entirely or it's reduced in length. And through the analysis of a number of different mutants, we've been able to improve our functional annotation of the RGP encoding clusters, uh, which has been transformative for us because when we started this, we really had no clue what really any of the genes encoded, what the functions might have been. So this has been a very useful process for us. And not only that, but it's allowed us to come up with a model for how the biosynthetic pathway of these RGPs might look like. And so it seems that the Ramnan uh, backbone or core structure is produced separately to the side chain, uh, which is then attached on the external uh, face of the cell um, and attached separately to the, to the core um, Ramnan structure. And in some cases, it may be polymerized. For other strains, it may not. So again, there's increasing uh, kind of complexity as we move from strain to strain. So from the phage perspective then, uh, which of course is why we're all here, um, we're very much interested in looking at the phage proteins that have the capability to bind to the host, so the host adhesion device. So for this, we took a model phage called STP1, which uh, is a monovirus. So again, which is one of the dominant groups of dairy streptococcophage. So to do this analysis, we, we could easily define or look at the, the tail structure of components so we could easily identify them. But again, the annotations weren't great. So we decided to try and improve this to understand exactly who was doing what job. So when we think about the adhesion device um, or the tail tip region that's involved in the interactions with a host, uh, there are some typical players, and this is a lambdoid kind of genome architecture. So we have the tail tape measure protein or the TMP. We have the distal tail protein or DIT, uh, tail associated lysin or TAL. And then downstream of that was another gene that all for the last decade or so we thought was just an accessory function. As it turns out through this analysis, perhaps it's actually the bona fide RBP. 
So again, reanalyzing, just like Enrique was saying, you know, going back to the data and looking at our functional annotations from 10 years ago to now, it changes massively. So what we can inform now is, is much better and it's quite exciting. So this is an old pet phage in our lab and it's great to finally be able to put some assignments on those functions. So when we did this analysis, we identified multiple uh, proteins with carbohydrate binding domains, which links back to our saccharidic receptor. And so when we looked at those, the DIT has a carbohydrate binding module, the TAL has two, and then we also found this gene that we thought was the accessory has a classical RBP head domain, um, which was very exciting finding for us. So um, Sylvain Monod's group 15 years ago came up with a really fantastic study where they identified the TAL as being uh, certainly responsible for the phage host interactions in uh, uh, dairy streptococci, which was very exciting. And they, what they found was variable regions one and two, they called them at the time. But again, now because these annotations and the tools are available, those variable regions are actually associated with carbohydrate binding modules. So they also predicted in, in their study through mutational analysis that additional proteins belong to the phage were also associated with these interactions. And now we can say with all of this kind of improvements in again in the tools that absolutely indeed the DIT should be involved uh, in that initial kind of scanning perhaps um, may not be as specific or provide us the same strength of binding, but certainly is doing the job of bringing the phage uh, into a docking position. And we suspect that the putative RBP, as we um, term it here until we did the analysis, um, was the bona fide receptor binding protein. So to explore this possibility, then we cloned the TAL and the RBP carbohydrate binding domains. We looked at their binding capabilities to um, a host cell in increasing concentrations of protein. And when we did this, we see that the RBP carbohydrate binding domain or the head domain has a much higher affinity or binds to a much greater extent than that of the TAL carbohydrate binding domain. So it would appear, at least in these studies, that the RBP or what we call now the RBP is in fact the, the bona fide receptor binding protein, while the variable regions or the carbohydrate binding domains in the TAL and probably for the DIT support that activity um, rather than being the primary receptors. So this is a, a new development uh, for us. We also did competition experiments between the TAL and RBP where we label them differentially and in each of those studies the RBP carbohydrate binding domain won out. So then we wanted to know where that protein was located on the, on the phage uh, to see is it genuinely an RBP. So we, uh, in collaboration with Christian Cambio and Adeline Goulet, we did single particle analysis of the tail tip region of STP1. And through this single particle analysis and through molecular modeling of the lactococcal phage uh, proteins um, into the, the um, structure that we had obtained, we see a very good fit for these protrusions that go around uh, the base of the tail for the RBP. And in the lower image, that's the yellow uh, structure that you see there. So it's a very good fit for an RBP. So we do believe now that this is genuinely the receptor binding protein for this phage. An unusual observation of a uh, dairy streptococcal phage is that many of them, or at least the majority, are very, very host specific. So we can use that to our advantage to look at strain specific interactions in more complex communities. So we decided to take this to the next level to look at a fermented dairy product or a whole series of them. So we looked at 27 uh, dairy products, looked for um, surviving strepto Streptococcus thermophilus um, isolates and their infecting phage. We had 20, 325 dairy streptococcal isolates. And when we screened the cheese samples, we found no phage against them. So this means that either there are no phage there, which I don't believe, um, or we just don't simply have the right host for them. So we thought, okay, well, let's look at the virome or the phageome then of these samples. And in doing so, we were able to map reads against uh, four of the five 
uh, groups of dairy streptococcophage in all eight samples, which tells us that yes, there are phage there, and in many cases, members of different groups. This also suggests that there are multiple strains in many of these fermentations. And this is much more informative than metagenome sequencing alone, because you can't separate out individual strains, particularly for Streptococcus thermophilus, whose strains are particularly uh, closely related and can be very difficult to separate. So, Phageome analysis of fermented foods is something that's relatively poorly explored to date. And here we're telling you that I think actually there's quite a diversity of phage out there and that we can maybe use this to look at more complex environments and to, to find down to strain level interactions that until recently haven't really been possible through culture omics. Um, or even metagenomics. And the partnership, I think, of metagenome and phageome will be really transformative to understanding relationships and cultures. And of course, I can't uh, claim the credit for all this work. I have a fantastic PhD student, Catherine Novell, um, and postdoc, Elvina Perlin Duncan, and Brian MacDonald. And of course, my friend and mentor uh, over the years, Dao Van Sindren, as well as a team of fantastic collaborators. Uh, right across France and Canada, as well as the fantastic Horst Neve in Max Rubner Institute in Germany. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. <laughs>